I'm not law enforcement, but I think that the things that were taken warrant law enforcement's attention. A Marlboro County man dies within hours. His friends show up. We all take with his security cameras rolling, his home's plundered, and things are carried out of his home with a county judge inside. They were ripping the man off, and he was, he hadn't even got cold. A criminal investigation delayed for months by a sheriff who did nothing. Why did you not investigate the Hollis Slate case? And a sheriff's office crumbling under the spotlight. Anything you want to say about these indictments? For a year now, a dead man's sister pleaded for an investigation. She wants to know why a deputy county probate judge showed up to her brother's home and plundered it. The families accused the judge of taking part in stealing cash, a gun, and other property that belonged to the man, along with impersonating a public official. Our investigation found the judge had not been sworn in when this happened, but she pretended to be. Security cameras at the home activated by motion sensors captured everything we're about to show you. Here's Fox 46 chief investigator Jody Barr with tonight's hour long special final disrespects. Hollis Slade knew he was in trouble after weeks of stomach pain. He called 911 for help. Slade was bleeding internally and could not move. I know, man. His wife, Joyce, was trying to get him help, but she couldn't do much for her husband and stood by helplessly as medics loaded him into an ambulance. Joyce suffers from dementia and can't be left alone. A fireman hung around to make sure she was cared for. How long have you two been together? A long time. A long time? I can't tell you how many years off the top of my head. What's the secret? Just loving each other. Loving each other so much. And he was such a bright, shining difference from what I had. He's been married a long time. I can't tell you how many years because my memory is not as long as it used to be. She didn't know it then, but she'd never see her husband again. One week shy of his 68th birthday, Hollis Slade was dead. Now we should probably explain these security cameras. Slade installed them to protect his thousands of dollars in foxhounds and Was it electric? to watch out for his wife when he left home. Nothing moved in Slade's yard without those cameras catching it. The family provided the recordings to us. Within hours of Slade's death, those cameras recorded Matthew Tomlinson's arrival. Hollis Slade had mentored Tomlinson and he was deeply involved in Slade's hound hobby. A bit later, Tomlinson returned with three others, his mother, Charlotte Green, her boyfriend, Ricky Gardner, and their friend, Will Adams. The recordings show Adams making multiple calls to coroners. The recordings don't show why. Adams also worked to find Slade's family members to tell them about the death. The recordings also show yeah, I don't really know. the group going in and out of Slade's home. I don't see nothing on the, on the computer. I got to look through the files. Huh? Field trial is 99% of it. And searching his property. Two wheel for a home. Bottom of the house. It might be. No, it says two hollows from bottom. He got a whole truck full of Christmas presents. Did he ain't no shit? The talk soon turns to who might end up with the things that belong to Hollis Slade. The recording show Will Adams eventually got in touch with an attorney seeking probate information. I think we got the right people working for us. And passed that legal advice along to Ricky Gardner and Charlotte Green. Drove that brother and went to Everything would go to her and assets. That's right. Like, but assets would be here, here, here's what, what Jason's saying and here's what Parker said. They, they actually said the same thing. So. I reckon that's the way the statute of law is, is that the oldest sibling. The recording abruptly ended there. The talk eventually turned to the things they didn't want to leave behind. It's kind of like he got $2,000 worth of tracking collars sitting in there. What about all the money in the bank? Well, it's unreal. Let me tell you. And I, I hate to leave $2,000 worth of yeah. tracking collars and two dollars sitting there. This document was on Hollis Slade's computer showing an accounting of those collars. There were 43 in all, 
Ricky Gardner's name was listed as the owner of 12 of those collars. Well, I hate to leave all this. It's going to be sad yeah. if somebody else comes to f- well, he didn't know he didn't want him to have it. He didn't want him to have it. I know he didn't want him to have it. I heard him say it. This whole room really is about Hollis. Beth Slade Bowling is Hollis Slade's oldest sister. She found out about her brother's death in one of those calls Will Adams made outside her brother's home. Bowling and her daughter hopped in the car the next morning to make the 12 hour trip from Indiana. Meanwhile, in Marlboro County, Ricky Gardner was the first to arrive the next morning. This evening, seven, eight o'clock or something. The video showed this was the first time they were alone with Joyce. The camera showed things soon started leaving the house and being loaded into Ricky Gardner's truck. The recording showed this continued through the day and sometime that morning. A woman who worked for the Marlboro County probate judge at the time showed up. That woman's name is Tammy Bullock. She had once worked with Hollis Slade at a paper mill he helped manage in town. She, too, did her share in the plundering. These cameras caught parts of conversations where Bullock, like the others, was there hunting for something specific. Just wiggle, because we don't know his sister. We all take in turns rummaging through stuff and sit in the car and kind of make her eat. And I'm hoping, oh, this all happened as Beth Slade Bowling was rushing toward South Carolina from Indiana. The group knew she was coming, and the video show they had a plan for when she got there. Coming up. So if anything comes up in the next let them know that his secretary for the past 30 years is now a probate judge, and if they need me, we just need to be nice. We just we don't need to talk finances. We don't need to say we turned the house upside down today trying to find the wheel. A sister on the way to plan her brother's funeral. I am figuring out that there are some untrustworthy people in Marlboro County, and I don't know what to do. Would end up in front of the county sheriff asking for a criminal investigation. They stole from Mr. Hollis. And the caretaker who says the group turned her into a witness. They were ripping the man off and he was, he hadn't even got cold. When our final disrespects investigation continues after the break. My daughter saved them and we put them on a drive at home so that we could protect them. When Beth Slade Bowling left Indiana for South Carolina, there's so many videos. She knew it was going to be a tough trip. She had a funeral to plan. She had to make sure her sister-in-law was cared for. She also had to figure out what she needed to do to make sure her brother's estate was intact so her sister-in-law could afford the around-the-clock care she needed for the rest of her life. When Bowling and her daughter got to her brother's home, the first people they met at the top of the driveway, Charlotte Green and Tammy Bullock. You soon learn that there's someone fairly important at the house. Yes. Pretty quickly, one of the people um, introduces herself, uh, and then she says, well, I'm the probate judge, and I say, Okay, good. We're probably going to need to work together then. To be clear that she is Tammy Bullock and she wasn't the probate judge. So, if anything comes up and you need to, you let them know that his secretary for the past 30 years is now a probate judge and if they need me. Bullock at the time worked in the Marlboro County Probate Judge's Office and had been appointed, but her oath of office and her own Facebook page show she wasn't sworn in as the county's deputy probate judge until March 15th, seven weeks after this meeting in Hollis Slade's driveway. So you thought you had help on scene? Yes. Were you relieved to know that someone who could take charge was there? Yes. I actually thought, okay, God's, you know, providing what I'm going to need to get a, to get through this because this is going to be hard. It was nearly two months later before she was sworn in yeah. as a deputy probate judge. Did that send off any alarm bells? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That basically confirmed what I was already 
figuring out from her activity at the house, something's awry here. Something's not on the up and up. At the time, Beth Slade Bowling had no reason to suspect anything of any of the people at her brother's home. She thought they were his grieving friends. That's until the family had a chance to talk alone with Linda Hood, Joyce's former caretaker. The caretaker said to me there were some things that had been taken out of the house that she thought I ought to get back fairly quickly. A handgun, um, a checkbook, a Ziploc bag full of cash, and the truck keys. At this point, I, we hadn't figured out all the players and what was happening, but that was concerning to me. It was like, why, why did they take those things out of the house? This recording shows Hood was likely telling the truth. Charlotte Green was at the back of this truck. And the video captured her admission that she took the pistol from the exact spot where the caretaker said she hid it. And I took Miss Joyce's money and Hollis's money and I put it in a um, sandwich bag, one of the quarts or the gallons. It was the big one. How big would you estimate the bag with your hands? How big was it? About like this. It was one of the big ones and it was loaded with money. A gallon bag? A gallon bag. So I took all the money and put it in a bag and stuck it in the middle of her dresser. Well, I went back Sunday morning. Charlotte told me she got all the money. They got Miss Joyce's pistol, it was a 38. Hollis Slade hired Linda Hood to care for his wife, Joyce. She'd been with the family since 2017. Hood stayed overnight with Joyce Slade the night her husband died and left the next morning. They told me to go home and get rest, but I would stay with her at night. They would come early in the morning and when I get there, stuff was disappearing. Stuff was getting gone. So when you left the house in the morning, when you got back that night, there were things missing out of it the house. It was clear. The living room was clear. Slade Bowling messaged Charlotte Green asking her to return the things Linda Hood said they'd taken. The next day, Slade Bowling says Ricky Gardner handed her this box, a box that also belonged to Hollis Slade. So they did have property that belonged to your brother with them? Yes. He returned a box with um, a Ziploc of cash, um, the, the handgun, um, and I think by then uh, somebody had already brought the truck keys back. I will tell you what you told the family that was missing, they got back. They no, got they got the money back, a little right. bit of money. And the pistol. And the pistol. They got a little bit of money because she showed me that bag. And the jury box. They got the money that was in the jury box. No, all that money wasn't in there. So there was a lot less money mm -hmm given to the family than you collected oh, yeah, in that they, house. They took it. The cameras continued rolling, capturing the group talking about other things that belonged to Hollis Slade. It's kind of like he got $2,000 worth of tracking collars sitting in there. What about all the money in the bank? Uh, it's, it's unreal. Look, and I'm telling you, and I, I hate to leave $2,000 worth of yeah. tracking collars and two garments sitting there. Well, I hate to leave all this. It's going to be sad if it. somebody else comes. Yeah. No, he didn't want him to have it. He didn't want him to have it. I know he didn't want him to have it. I heard him say They even joked about taking something out of Hollis Slade's truck. Oh, me and Tammy got four packs of cigarettes out there, too. We figured he didn't need them no more. Well, I, I know where a whole bunch of them are. I'm about to say it's hard, mate. And that talk continued until minutes before Slade's family arrived. Slade had around 30 foxhounds and funded a hunting kennel that he, Ricky Gardner, and Matthew Tomlinson were all part of. One of the videos shows Gardner walking out of the house with what appeared to be a registration certificate for one of Hollis Slade's hounds. It looks just like this turned upside down. Uh, I think that's definitely it. It's got, it has the same uh, border, it has the seal, it has, it looks like Hunter's horn there. I, it's. 
I think it's it's got to be dog certificates. And those hunting collars Ricky Gardner mentioned earlier, the videos show Gardner walking out with a box with Garmin stamped across it. Slade had a rack built by his front door where he stored around 30 other collars. The same door where cameras captured Ricky Gardner carrying this large plastic tub out toward his truck. We could not confirm whether Gardner owned any of those collars. These are the boxes that proves that Hollis had collars. They're the Garmin's TT15s and they're the Garmin's TT10s. After finding the videos, the Slade family fired Linda Hood and put everyone in the videos on trespass notice. See, this is a whole entire set. The family hired Kath Shockley to stay with Joy Slade and to work to figure out what left the Slade home in those boxes. These are completely different sets right here. That's the TT10s. And it also has the dog's names on them too. When he said $2,000 worth, he was correct. Okay, we have this. Where is, where is this? Again, a missing, you know, product. See, there's guts right there. But the unit's missing? Right. So that's why I've kept all these boxes and like gathered them together and put things together to make sure that, you know, I was correct on missing items because I didn't want to, you know, start saying something was gone when it really wasn't. But now he had a wooden rack by the front door and it had electric dog collars. And they cost a lot of money. And he used them when they went to the pens with his dog. Well, they got gone. The regular dog collars got gone. The wormer, all the liquid stuff, anything that pertained to a dog, they got it. We ask every person in these videos for an interview, and we ask multiple times. We wanted to make sure each one had a chance to explain what these videos show. The only response we got was from Ricky Gardner, who directed us to his attorney, but his attorney never responded to our outreach. We also asked Judge Bullock to meet with us, but she wouldn't stop long enough to talk. We sent her multiple emails, texts, and called her office. We waited a week for her to respond before we took the interview to her courthouse. Well, we missed her. Bullock took off as soon as she spotted us. She came back a few minutes later with a Bennettsville police escort. We then went inside to finish our interview and found Judge Bullock's boss, probate judge Mark Heath, at the door. Hey, Judge. Good morning. How you doing? I'm great. We'd like to talk to you about Judge Bullock if you've got a second. Uh, I'm in. If you got any questions, you see her attorney, Mr. Wade, write it down. And I want you to write your information uh, down. We will. We'll be glad to do that. Do that. Who's her attorney? Mr. Wade R. Crow. Wade Crow, an attorney in town, is now Tammy Bullock's attorney. But he was Joyce Slade's guardian ad litem until May. When we reached out, Attorney Crow told us he ordered Judge Bullock to not make any statements to us about this case. We also learned Bullock's boss, Judge Heath, was told about these allegations in January. This was text to the probate judge, uh, Mark Heath. Bobby Norris was Hollis Slade's neighbor. He also officiated Slade's funeral. This is actually the text that I sent him to give me a call back. When Norris found out about Bullock's claim she was the county's probate judge, he got on the phone with Judge Heath to tell him what happened. I saw the girls out here saying she's the probate judge and she was in charge of it. I said, I, I didn't know that was going on. Knew it on me and I've been here all my life and I pretty well know what's going on in the town. That's one thing I do. What we're here about is there's some criminal allegations that have been made against her. Uh, haven't, haven't there are. I'm not aware of them. I haven't been advised of them. Well, you have. Need to go to the sheriff's department. Did Bobby Norris not call you in January and have a discussion with you on January 29th? No comment. Norris says Heath assured him he'd investigate, but seven weeks later, Judge Heath swore Tammy Bullock in as his deputy judge. Well, that's that's why we're here, Judge. It's not to cause you any problems. We want to make sure that you and and Miss Judge Bullock both have an opportunity sure. to respond. So. Okay. And, and thank you, but we we really don't have a response. There's not enough information at this point. Do you care to know? I'm, I'm happy to share with you what I, we have. I don't, I don't want to have any hearsay. I'll hear it in a court. Well, we've got video. This is all video recorded. This isn't just some hearsay. Okay. All right. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. Did they have any business being in that house, carrying anything out, going through that house looking for a will or whatever they were doing inside? I don't believe so. I don't, I don't think... 
that it, I don't think it was their place. Um, I don't think it was their right. I don't think I don't think my brother would have wanted that. You think Joyce got taken advantage of? Yes, absolutely. Joyce got taken advantage of. I have no doubt about that. Is this a case of had these people never gone in there, never taken one box out of that house, you would not have a question about something being missing today or who may have taken it? Accurate. Yeah, that's totally accurate. The day Tammy Bullock was sworn into office, Ricky Gardner and Charlotte Green paid Joyce Slade one last visit. This time, Kath Shockley stood guard. The same cameras that captured everything the weekend of Hollis Slade's death also showed the people in those recordings were strangers to his wife. I don't even know who they are. And I know that the position it put Joyce in being in the house while all that was going on was, I don't know, atrocious. That, I mean, I think that was awful. When you drove into Marlboro County, South Carolina, did you ever anticipate that eight months later you'd be dealing with something like this? Absolutely not. Coming up, none of the people in these videos would agree to be interviewed and none of them charged with a crime, except one. She had the gun right to my face and was like, I'll shoot you, Shonda. An argument between Tammy Bullock and her roommate ended with a weapons charge for the deputy probate judge. Bullock was never arrested until we showed up with questions when our final disrespects report continues after the break. A little more than a month after our final disrespects investigation began, the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division finally opened an investigation into what we uncovered. Four months into that investigation, SLED has not charged anyone related to the Hollis Slade estate. The Slade family met with the Marlboro County Sheriff Charles Lemon three days after Hollis Slade's death to report what they believe were crimes committed in these videos. Coming up, a felony gun charge, a Supreme Court investigation, and an elected judge wanting the Hollis Slade case taken away from Marlboro County. Can I talk to you about this letter you sent us? Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm good. And the Marlboro County Sheriff admits what he really did with the Hollis Slade estate investigation when our final disrespect report continues after this. I was on the ground and she was over me like this. She was standing right above me and had it like right to my face and I was looking up at her and she was saying, I will and shoot you, Shonda. Shonda Nash says she was on the business end of Marlboro County Deputy Probate Judge Tammy Bullock's pistol. The women were roommates and shared this home in Bennettsville until February. We're arguing and it got heated. Well, she slammed the door and I heard her mirror break. And I was like, what the hell are you doing? And she came out the room and she had the gun. Show me how she had it. She had it in her hand like this. She says it all started after Bullock tried to discipline Nash's daughter, and it wasn't the first time. My daughter's 17, and like I told her, I said, if you have something to say about my daughter, come to me, you know, and we can discuss it, and I'll discuss it with my daughter. Had you threatened her in any way? No. Um, we were just arguing. I mean, we were calling each other names, you know what I'm saying, and stuff, but, I mean... I don't own a gun. I don't own a knife. I mean, I don't even know how to shoot a gun. You know, so I mean. Were you trying to fight her? No. We were arguing. I mean, it was a heated argument. We were in each other's face and stuff, you know, yelling at each other. But I mean, I never tried to swing on her or grab her or anything like that. It took Nash a few days to call the Bennettsville Police Department to file a police report. Mainly, she says, because she was renting half the home from Bullock and had nowhere else to live. And Bullock's position inside the county's court system caused her to hesitate. With her being a public official like that, a lot of people do know her. That's why whenever all this happened, I kind of, I wasn't sure what to do because I know she's well known around here, so it was kind of like, the police department opened an investigation and interviewed both Tammy Bullock and Shonda Nash. The investigator charged Bullock with pointing and presenting a firearm, but the department did not charge Bullock under the state criminal code, which is a felony carrying up to five years in prison. 
Instead, the police never arrested Tammy Bullock. They wrote her a traffic ticket, charging her with pointing and presenting a firearm under a misdemeanor city ordinance, where a conviction there could carry a $500 fine or up to 30 days in jail. Did the Bennettsville Police Department in any way do Tammy Bullock a favor by charging her this way? Absolutely not. After this interview, Bennettsville Police Chief Kevin Miller asked the city attorney to review his department's handling of the Bullock case. Although the attorney found no wrongdoing, the city decided the facts warranted the state level felony charge. In her case, handled by a prosecutor with no ties to the city or to Marlboro County. Ms. Bullock, is there anything you want to say? One month after our investigation aired, Tammy Bullock walked into the Bennettsville Police Department to surrender to a pointing and presenting charge. Officers escorted Bullock into the Marlboro County Jail in handcuffs and like any other person charged with a crime, she had her mugshot taken, she was fingerprinted and spent a few hours inside waiting on a bond hearing. She spent exactly two hours and 35 minutes inside the county jail before walking out the front door under a $5,000 bond. All right, the judge. In late November, Tammy Bullock asked a city judge to dismiss the charge. The judge said no, sending Bullock's case to the South Carolina Attorney General for prosecution. Was it pointed at you in your face? It How was pointed right here in my face. Shonda Nash says she didn't expect the system to take her allegations seriously. Coming up, the state Supreme Court sets its sights on Marlboro County, and the elected probate judge wants nothing else to do with the Hollis Slade estate. And Tammy Bullock gives up her position of power. We'll be back right after the break. Within days of our final disrespects broadcast, the South Carolina Supreme Court had its sights set on Marlboro County and County Deputy Probate Judge Tammy Bullock. I seen my mom on the floor with her hand like this and Tammy was like this and she was like, I can shoot you Shonda. Brianna Troutman says she saw the moment Deputy Probate Judge Tammy Bullock pointed a gun at her mother's face. From that gun charge to the more than 1,000 video clips, both events helped launch an investigation by the Supreme Court's Office of Disciplinary Counsel. Hey, Judge. Good morning. How you doing? I'm great. We'd like to talk to you about Judge Bullock if you've got a second. Come in. By the time the state stepped in to investigate, nine months had passed from the time Bullock's boss, elected probate judge Mark Heath, first learned the allegations against his deputy judge. Despite the claims, Heath issued Bullock's oath less than two months after he was told about what happened in these recordings. But you swore in on March 15th, six weeks after the initial allegations were made to you. Okay, good to see you. All right, thanks, Judge. Two weeks after the Supreme Court launched its investigation, Judge Mark Heath filed a recusal, asking the state's chief justice to move the Hollis Slade case out of Marlboro County. We all taking turns rummaging through stuff and sitting in the corner. Oh, me and Tammy got full pack of cigarettes out there, too. We figured he didn't need them no more. Less than a month after we first told the world about those security camera recordings, Deputy Probate Judge Tammy Bullock resigned. All right, let's call Tammy Bullock. Hey, you've reached Tammy. At the tone, please record your message. But we never found out exactly why. Last month, the South Carolina Supreme Court moved the Hollis Slade probate case out of Marlboro County. Coming up. Do you think you got a fair and thorough investigation there? No, I got, in my mind, put off. After promising an investigation, the sheriff's office went silent. Following months of investigating the sheriff, we uncovered something no one saw coming. A body camera recording kept from the public for nearly two years, and a sheriff now facing decades in prison. When our final disrespects report continues, after the break. What's going on? Congress doesn't feel good. Just go back in the house and sit down. Miss Linda's gone cool. Okay. 
The videos captured outside Hollis Slade's home showed a new widow appearing lost and confused. Joyce Slade had just lost her husband, the one person who made sure she was cared for as her dementia got a little worse each year. I don't see nothing on the, on the computer. Joyce was also inside as her husband's friend showed up within hours of his death and began plundering the Slade's home. Where I hate to leave all this. It's going to be sad yeah, if that. somebody else comes. Yeah. Yeah. No, he didn't want him to have it. He didn't want him to have it. No, he didn't want him to have it. I heard him say. The recording showed people leaving with things, and Marlboro County Deputy Probate Judge Tammy Bullock eventually showed up. We all taking turns. Hollis Slade's sister, Beth Bowling, and her daughter, Sarah, reluctantly took those recordings to Marlboro County Sheriff Charles Lemon. Bowling, the county coroner, the sheriff's lead investigator, and the sheriff all met at the sheriff's office within days of Hollis Slade's death, where the Bowlings told everything they found. I started the conversation saying I am leery and hesitant to even bring this to you because I'm not sure who to take it to. I am figuring out that there are some untrustworthy people in, um, in Marlboro County. Bowling says the sheriff assured the family he'd investigate. The sheriff tells you we're gonna call the people in these videos in, we're gonna interrogate them, mm -hmm. and indicated to you in no uncertain terms that they were opening a criminal investigation. Yes. But nothing happened. The weeks turned to months, and after calls and emails to the sheriff's office, Slate's family never got confirmation of an investigation. And we found out why. We got this letter from Sheriff Charles Lemon in October. He wrote it after we threatened legal action over two Freedom of Information Act requests he ignored. The sheriff confirmed in the letter his office never opened an investigation into any of the criminal allegations the bowlings reported to him in January. The sheriff writes, there was no incident report done, no interviews, no body cams, no tickets, no photos, no recordings, no warrants, no witnesses or victim statements. But now you know 10 months later, in fact, no investigation at all was conducted. What do you think? I think they were intentionally being deceitful. We continued to contact the sheriff's department um, and we, you know, put together all of um, the videos in an online drive and sent it to someone at the sheriff's department. And we, you know, were contacting them, asking questions about it um, and getting very little response. Um, and then he specifically told us that they would start bringing people in and um, questioning them separately um, to try and figure out who did what and who took what. Um, and that they would then help us recover those lost items. I don't think they ever had any intention of doing anything. They clearly didn't do anything. I think they intended to deceive us. The sheriff says he had reasons. He claimed in his letter that since Hollis Slade's home was in the city limits of Bennettsville, Bennettsville police should have investigated. And the sheriff claimed Bowling had already reported this to Bennettsville police, and he couldn't investigate because of that even writing that Bowling was not happy with the Bennettsville police when she filed her report with the sheriff in January. Beth Bowling says that's a lie. Did you ever at any point in time call the Bennettsville Police Department before you met with the sheriff? No, I did not. Had you had any conversations with the Bennettsville Police Department about those security cameras or Tammy Bullock? I did not talk to anybody at the Bennettsville Police Department until four or five weeks ago. It was my first um, interaction with them at all. When did Beth Bowling contact the Bennettsville Police Department to file a report? Never. We showed the sheriff's letter to Bennettsville Police Chief Kevin Miller. Miller says the sheriff's statements about the city's involvement are not just untrue, but the opposite of the truth. It says Ms. Bowling advised she was not happy in quotes with the Bennettsville Police Department and wanted us to investigate the, the incident that occurred. When did you know videos existed in this case? When I saw your report. The sheriff also claimed in his letter that he contacted the county prosecutor after that January meeting. The solicitor says that did not happen. For weeks, we tried to schedule an interview with Sheriff Charles Lemon. The sheriff ignored every attempt. We eventually found him patrolling a small town and watched as he rode through neighborhoods in a police truck with Deputy Fred Knight, who happens to be the former 
Marlboro County Sheriff. We watched and waited for Lemon to return to his police truck. Sheriff, good evening. How are you doing? Can I talk to you about this letter you sent us? Uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm good. Why did you not investigate the Hollis Slate case? <laughs> We found the sheriff again at a county council meeting later that night. He wouldn't talk there either, but he shot video of us shooting video of him. I and other people from the sheriff's office were very upfront in that meeting and in that hallway outside of that meeting that this was absolutely a conflict. We had no vested interest in that case. A few weeks ago, Sheriff Lemon's lead investigator, Lieutenant Trevor Murphy, decided to set the record straight. We had no interest in it. It was an absolute conflict for us. We got a county employee who was the same of us allegedly committing a crime in city jurisdiction. There was no reason for us to touch it. I know there were allegations that they weren't happy with the city police department, which is completely manufactured. I've never heard anything like that. Um, but he was told by me, by the um, evidence custodian, by other investigators, we need to stay out of this. We need to mind our own business. We were coming off on a week. We were coming off a weekend prior. We had two homicides within six hours. We were balls to the wall. We were working nonstop through that weekend. There, this was just something on top that we didn't need to touch, that we didn't need to be involved in. And the response was, I'm the sheriff. If I want to look into it, I will. But don't worry, I'll take care of it. When we interviewed Lieutenant Murphy in November, he knew he would likely lose his job. Even at one point, I think, you know, they even made the comment that, hey, you know, um, I feel like something's being covered up. And I think I responded to the family, you know, if you think something's been covered up, contact SLED. Like, contact SLED, have them look into it. And to me, that was a kind of backhand way of saying, go to them. Go to them and tell them what's going on. That will make them look into it. That will make them come ask him what's going on. And he has no choice. And it didn't happen. And it just got to the point where after so much time had gone by, it was to the point where I was tired of being put off, tired, tired of putting them off, and I finally just contacted SLED myself and just said, look, I'm going to contact SLED if something comes from it and something happens to me, at this point it is what it is, I'm just tired of this nonsense. Murphy also had something else he wanted the public to know about Sheriff Charles Lemon. Uh, is it hot? Yes, sir. It's hot? When y'all take the cuffs off of when he turn around, stick that taser to his head. That's the sheriff ordering a deputy to tase a handcuffed inmate in May 2020. If he turn around, pop it to him. Give him what he asked for. Check the door. Murphy and his investigators told us they tried for two years to get this recording out to the public and to law enforcement, but no one, the investigators say, would listen. You know, it was scary when you're, st you're potentially standing up to the most powerful man in the county um, who's backed by a system that's been historically oppressive. Um, it was very scary, um, but we knew it had to be done and it was necessary. On December 14th, two months after the first episode in our final disrespects investigation aired, the Marlboro County Grand Jury indicted Sheriff Charles Lemon and the deputy in this video, charging each with misconduct in office and felony assault and battery. The governor suspended Charles Lemon from office. We found the sheriff packing up his office and patrol truck. Mr. Lemon, hey, I'm Jody with Fox Charlotte. Anything you want to say about these indictments? Yeah, we got a murder down there. Why don't you go down there and see who saw that murder? I've been down there. Do you, is there anything at all you want the public to know about these charges? The South Carolina Attorney General assigned the office's criminal division head, Heather Weiss, to prosecute the sheriff and the deputy. The AG said the video showed the pair unlawfully tased Gerald Johnson multiple times. At one point, the video showed Johnson was tased, even as it appeared he attempted to do what the deputy was screaming at him to do. Get up, get in the cell, Get in there. Pop two, pop two, pop two, pop two, pop two, pop two. There you go. Get to the floor. Get in there. Get pop two, pop two. There you go. What do you think caused today? You were a huge uh, part of that. Um, 
when you started doing some investigative reporting into him, uh, obviously, first of all, that's when we had eyes on it. Um, you know, you've been provided the documents that SLED has been provided. There's When these things happen in the past, we reached out to SLED through third-party sources and anonymous sources. We reached out to other media outlets. Um, we tried to get the word out there, and our, 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 our request became unanswered. Then one week later, both men, flanked by their private attorneys, were arraigned on the charges. The prosecutor loaded the body camera recording onto a laptop, then handed it to the judge. As the sound of the recording echoed through the courtroom, both Lemon and Cook stood silently as the judge watched every second. But he was out of control, disorderly, combative, not following instructions. The sheriff's attorney told the judge, despite what the body camera showed, there's good reason for what Sheriff Lemon did in the video. It's clear that we believe that the sheriff, Lemon, and the other deputy involved were doing the best they could to get him into the cell without any violence, without anybody getting hurt. But I will say that in a, in a jail setting, uh, somebody's got to be in control. And the question is, is that going to be law enforcement? Or is it going to be people who have been arrested and brought there? As soon as the judge announced the $25,000 bonds, deputies arrested Charles Lemon and Andrew Cook and walked them out a side door. Sled agents drove the men back to the Marlboro County Jail. They were escorted into the jail where the sheriff was fingerprinted. His charges entered into the jail's booking system and the jailers who once answered to the county's most powerful law enforcer had him remove his face mask to take his mug shot. The same for former Deputy Cook. Defendants have no comment. 47 minutes later. Anything you want to say on your way out of here? Suspended Sheriff Charles Lemon and former Deputy Andrew Cook hurried to an awaiting car and sped away from the jail where this all began. Joyce Slade no longer calls Marlboro County home. She's living in Florida with family, far away from the home she once shared with her husband. It's kind of like you got $2,000 worth of tracking collars sitting in there. What about all the money in the bank? Sled agents continue investigating what happened in these videos. The state hasn't charged anyone with any crime related to the Slade estate and none of the people depicted in these videos would agree to be interviewed for our final disrespects investigation.